Hello, I'm Dr. Ron Charles. Thanks for tuning into the program today. You know, the Sermon on the Mount has been um, presented in a number of different ways. Uh, you have books written about it. You have uh, TV programs about it. Uh, you have movies written about it. And uh, But there's been a lot of misunderstanding about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Hollywood likes to portray Jesus as walking down uh, through the crowds of people on the on the hillsides and uh, sharing his wisdom that we have re recorded in the Sermon on the Mount. But the Sermon on the Mount was not given to the multitudes. It was given to the disciples. At that time, he had six. It was not the twelve. Later on, when he repeated many of these teachings in uh, Luke, the sixth chapter, he had twelve disciples then. But on this particular occasion, he only had six, and uh, and these six were being uh, taught by Jesus on how to minister the way that he wanted them to minister, how to teach the people, how to talk to them, how to how to do the things that he wanted to be done, and uh, the emphasis that he wanted to give to those people. And the disciples needed to knew that, know that they needed to minister like him. They needed to be on the same page as him as far as philosophy and as far as his, uh, his doctrine was concerned. They needed to, uh, to, to be interwoven with him. And they needed to be intertwined with him so that uh, there would be no conflict. There would be no lack of focus. There would be a, 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 a straight path to everything that he wanted to do without any conflict from them. And so, uh, so he began to teach them and tell them what he wanted them to know, how he wanted them to proceed. And one of the interesting things that he did is that he, uh, when he took them up to uh, the horns of Hatin, and this is probably where this sermon took place. Of course, now, if you go to Israel today, you'll have uh, you'll have many different um, uh, opinions about where the Sermon on the Mount was taking place. And you have many monuments over there that shows that, well, it actually took place here. Or, no, no, it wasn't there. It was actually on this mountain and so on and so forth. But but uh, the uh, in, in my opinion, the leading candidate would be the, the Horns of Hattin. It's a, a double mountain, extinct volcano. Um, a double peaked uh, extinct volcano that is uh, just west of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, from the heights of the Horns of Hattin, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the Sea of Galilee in the distance. You can see the Jordan River Valley. And if you look very closely, you may be able to see uh, ruins of some of the cities. And one of the ruins that was in that direction now, whether the Jesus and the disciples could actually see the ruins with their naked eye at, at that point, we don't know. It was probably at least uh, um, probably between 10 and 12 miles away. So it, it could have been possible to see it, but most likely not. But Jesus certainly could point it into that direction. He says, all of you know the history of what happened in Sepphoris. All of you realize what went on as he pointed that direction. And so he made this particular teaching concerning that. And let's look at it, the sixth chapter of Matthew. We'll begin to read verse number 20. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are you not much better than they? And which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit into your stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, there was history behind this. Back in the year 11 AD, when Jesus was, um, was just a teenager, 
um, Sipporah was uh, came under attack by the uh, the governor of Syria, Cyrenius, uh, because of rebellion. The city of Sipporah began to uh, give a, a safe haven to um, uh, some Jewish revolutionaries, some zealots. There wasn't many of them, there was only a few hundred, but uh, they were given uh, the Roman authorities some major headaches by um, attacking the tax uh, uh, trains that were hauling the taxes to uh, Caesarea Philippi or Caesarea Maritima. And um, they were attacking uh, Roman officials and so forth. Uh, the, the city of Sapporos at this time uh, had over 100,000 people, but it was a Roman city. It was uh, primarily a Roman city, and uh, but there were some Jews that were there. There were some uh, Jewish sympathizers uh, that were there among the Romans. And uh, these sympathizers uh, uh, took it upon themselves to uh, give safe haven to the, uh, to the zealots, to the Jewish rebels who were given such problems to Roman authority. And uh, initially, the uh, Roman governors uh, and the Roman authorities really didn't do anything about it. They, um, uh, they slapped some fines on the people, uh, maybe a, a baker or a restaurant or whatever may have given free food to these uh, rebels or may have given uh, uh, the opportunity to stay the night without paying or, or whatever. But anyway, they helped them out quite, uh, quite a bit. And then it, it, then it advanced beyond that. It, go, it, it advanced to the point of they would actually, when the rebels would go on a raiding uh, mission, that they would attack a, a Roman caravan or, or a, a Roman uh, merchant or a, a, Ro a Roman bank, and they would clear it out and they would uh, leave dead Romans in, in their wake, and they would actually run back to Sepporah for safekeeping. The friends there would, uh, even though it was a Roman city, there was um, uh, there were Romans, there were uh, Jewish sympathizers there among the Roman citizenry, and they would put them up. They would hide them. And when the Roman authorities would come, then the Jewish rebels would, would not be found. And so uh, it, it was becoming a, a major, major issue. They tried to uh, talk with the, uh, with the leaders of the city and uh, tried to resolve the thing diplomatically, and it just didn't work. So finally, support uh, uh, Sirius uh, in the year 11 A.D., he came down from Damascus uh, with a Roman army of over 28,000. And they laid siege to the city and uh, as using as the excuse that the city was harboring rebels. And they truly were. There were over 3,000 uh, Jewish rebels that had, was taken refuge in the city. Um, and Unfortunately, uh, that left 70, 80, 90,000 people who really didn't know anything about what was going on. They were innocent, innocent bystanders. But the Romans did not tolerate problems. They had 0% tolerance for rebels, 0% uh, tolerance for those that supported the rebels. And so... Serenius took the army, surrounded the city, and not only killed the rebels who were there, but he ended up killing and putting into slavery 78,000 people who were part of that city, of over 100,000, of near 100,000. And so 78,000 thousand people were killed, were slaughtered, or taken as slaves. And then after that, the city itself was destroyed. 
All the buildings were burned or torn down. All the walls were torn down. Even the foundations were plowed up so there would be no remembrance of the city ever again. And then after that, the salt that all Roman soldiers took with them on their uh, on any of their um, uh, any of their campaigns that they took, they always took a pouch, a pouch of salt. And so Serenius told them and commanded that each soldier empty his pouch of salt upon the area that was Sepporus and that had been plowed up. And so now the salt was forced uh, into the ground. And then he told each soldier to fill his pouch of salt, fill them with rocks, and then go back and pelt the entire region that was Sepporus with stones and with rocks so that there would be no chance of anything ever growing there again and no chance of anything could ever be plowed up and planted there, any crops or flowers or anything. Total and complete devastation. And then after that, he dug a ditch around the old city site. That ditch was approximately eight feet deep and approximately three to four feet wide. And he put stones of uh, sulfur in the ditch all the way around the city. And then they lit the sulfur, set it on fire. And for years, this poisonous sulfuric smoke and the stench would, would come up from the ditch totally surrounding the area and clouded over the area that used to be the uh, very uh, life, uh, uh, lively city of Sepporos. And it was totally devastated. And that poisonous sulfuric gas stayed there, not allowing any life whatsoever. No birds would fly over the area. No animals would come in through the area. It was totally, completely, 100% dead. And Jesus pointed out, this dead city was never intended to live again. Never intended. It was never intended by the Romans for any flowers to grow for any animals to grow, for any birds to fly over the area. It was never intended for it to ever live again. But look, look at it. There are flowers. Consider the lilies of the field. Look at it and look at the birds. The birds are actually flying over. Why? Because eventually the sulfur rocks begin to go out. There wasn't as much poison being pumped into the air. And some of that salt that was laid out didn't go into the ground. It, it fell on leaves or sticks or even stones themselves. And grass that could have been underneath that began to grow again. The flowers began to grow again. And that that was as intended to be dead forever, begin to have life again. You know, many times when you, we, we, we have done uh, travels throughout the world, and there are times that a particular area, a particular region, especially in Europe, when you talk about the religious wars and the 100 years war and World War I, World War II, an entire region would be just absolutely devastated is totally wiped out. Nothing, nothing, nothing left. And it would be the opinion of the locals that this is dead forever, forever dead. But amazingly, you can look at those battlefields and the trees have grown back. The grass has grown back. 
the flowers have grown back. Houses begin to be built again. Water begins to spring up from the depths again. And life returns because the world is in the hands of God. So poor us begin to live again. And Jesus pointed out, he says, guys, look at it. Look at it. Those birds, they 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 don't toil they they don't they they don't plant wheat they don't plant corn but your heavenly father takes care of them look they're even flying over this condemned area of death that was never supposed to have life look there they are and your heavenly father takes care of it and look at these lilies of the field look at these how beautiful they are the lilies of the valley, the, the poppies, look, look how beautiful they are. They were never intended to live again. And it was the wish of the enemy that they would be dead forever, never to live again. But your heavenly father had other ideas. They spring up in the midst of a soil that should be dead from the salt. They spring up between the rocks that have been cast out to destroy them. They spring up even though there was death all around them. And now look at them. They're the most beautiful sight. And even Solomon and all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Uh, you, you, you are more important than all birds. You're more important than, than all flowers. You're more important than the restoration and life given to that that was absolute, total, and complete death. So your Heavenly Father cares about you. Yes, you have given up your fishing business. You've given up your lawyer business. You've given up all the things that you had in the past and have joined me. But your heavenly father will reward you openly. You will lose nothing. You will absolutely lose nothing because your heavenly father will care for you. He'll take care of you and you dedicate yourself to me. And I will see that you are rewarded not only in this life, but in the life to come. You receive manifold more than anything you ever even begin to hope or think for. Because your Heavenly Father is in control. Look at Sephoris over in that direction. You may not be able to see the plowed up foundations. You may not be able to see the ruins. But you know where it is right over there. You've been there. You've been by there. You've seen it. It all happened in your lifetime. You know what happened. It was intended to be absolute death from this time forward or from that time forward. But God in his mercy has brought life into that that was certain death. And Jesus said to these disciples, he says, I am with you. I bring you life. And your heavenly father is more caring about you than anything that has happened over there. You know, in your own particular lives, you may have faced the same type of thing. You may have had a happy marriage and then the enemy came in to destroy it. You may have had a happy household, thriving, living. And then through deception, through sin, whatever the case may be, or maybe through innocence, that lovely household came to destruction. And it collapsed and it fell. And seemingly there was no life. Maybe your own personal circumstances. 
bankruptcy, financial problems, difficulties with fathers, mothers, family, and that the enemy wanted to destroy it once and for all, and for it never to be remembered again, never to be resurrected again. Your enemy wanted you bankrupt, never to have any funds, never to have any, uh, any peace in your economic situations in your family. Wanted you to be forever at odds with that former husband or that former wife that the children's lives are in absolute total chaos, not knowing what's going to happen next in their lives and them not knowing and, and many times not caring what happens in their lives because you don't seem to care, so why should I care? And so it's a thing that the enemy has done to destroy. And maybe that thing in your life has reached the point of destruction. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to react. You don't know where to go from here. Salt has been sowed in your relationships. Rocks are in your way. It can't possibly survive. The family can't possibly survive. The institution can never be resurrected. But Jesus says, just a minute. What your enemy has tried to destroy and to never bring back, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I will bring back that that has been destroyed. You trust me. You give your life to me. You give the circumstances to me. You give your finances to me. You give your marriage to me. You give your reconciliation of family to me. And it will live again. Because look at the birds. Look at the lilies of the field. They're beautiful. They don't care what happened here before. They don't mind flying and living in an environment that's hostile because they know that their Heavenly Father will take care of them regardless of the situation. So in your life, in your situation, regardless of what it is, Jesus cares. Jesus loves you. And Jesus is telling you this, just because you can see the destruction doesn't mean that you have to live in the destruction. And just because you remember how difficult it was, and just because you remember how your enemy totally destroyed everything, does not mean that you have to live in that place for the rest of your life. And even though the poison was sown, and even though that sulfuric gas was meant to never allow you to see the light of day again in peace, your God has his own way of blowing that poison away. He has his own way of restoring he has his own way of neutralizing the salt that's been planted in your life. And he will. He will neutralize that. So give, give him a chance today. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, now's the time to do it. Give him an opportunity to take control of your life. Just by saying, Heavenly Father, I, I confess my sins. I know that I have sinned, so I confess those. I ask your forgiveness, and I ask Jesus to come into my life to be my Savior. And even if you're already saved and have faced these catastrophic situations, know this, 
that your God loves you and that your Jesus is standing by your side and that your Jesus relates to what you've done, what you've gone through, where you've been. He relates to it and he says, come unto me, all that are laborers and are heavy laden and are beat down, and I will give you rest and I will bring restoration. And so give him a chance, come to him, come to him and say, my Lord Jesus, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to fix this, but you do. So I give it to you. I give you the salt. I give you the rocks. I give you the poison to sulfur. I give you the destruction of my life of my marriage, of my finances, of my job, of my family. I give it to you. I, I've made a mess of it. Of no fault of my own, perhaps. But it is a mess. There's no way I can fix it. So I give it to you, willingly, and asking that you undertake, and that you heal, and that you make a difference in my life. And he will just like he did for Sipporah. Sipporah did come back. It became a thriving city 20 years after this point. And it was one of the greatest cities in that region for many hundreds of years after that. So Jesus can do it in your life too. Just give him a chance today, accepting him and accepting his love and accepting his direction. May the Lord bless you greatly. Dr. Ron Charles has spent over 50 years researching and uncovering the truths about the life of Jesus and information that proves the historical authenticity of the Bible. Gleaned from his years of tireless work, research, ministry, and archaeological work, and watch the pages of the Bible come to life like never before. Go to cubitfoundation.org and place your order today. All proceeds go directly to Cubit Foundation's efforts around the world.